Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be reading chapter 10 of the Enola Holmes mystery, The Case of the Missing Marquess. Let's get ready. Chapter the 10th. On the ground again with my skirts down where they belonged, my black hat pinned to cover my unkept head, and my veil pulled down to conceal my face, I walked blindly. I did not know what to do. Around one finger, one gloved forefinger, I twisted a lock of long blonde curled hair. The rest I had left where I had found it. I imagined the wild birds taking it away strand by strand to line their nests. I thought of the mute, enraged message of the runaway boy had left his secret in his secret sanctuary. I thought of the tears I had seen on his mother f mother's face, poor lady, but equally poor lad, made to wear velvet and lace, almost as bad as the steel-ribbed corset. Not all, not at all inci incidentally, I thought of myself, I, Enola, on the run just like young Lord Tewksbury, except that it was hoped he had been to the sense to change his name. Fool I had been, coming here and as Enola Holmes, I had put myself in jeopardy. I needed to get away. Still, I must reassure the unfortunate Duchess. No, no, I should leave Basil, Basil Weather Park as quickly as possible before. Mrs. Holmes, sniffing, I found myself on the carriage drive directly in front of Basil Weather Hall, uncertain whether to advance or retreat, when a voice called, to me from above, Mrs. Holmes, hiding the block of long blonde, of blonde hair in the palm of of one hand, I turned to see a man, in a traveling co cloak, hurrying down the marble steps towards me. One of the detectives from London. Excuse me for pressure, presuming upon your, adequance, he said when he stood before me, but the lodge keeper informed us you were still here. And I wondered. He was a small, weasel-like man, hardly mus hardly the muscular one you'd sort of expect a police department, yet fearsome in a way his beady eyes peered at me, like shiny black ladybugs trying to crawl right through my veil. In a rather high-pitched voice, he went on, I am a an acquaintance of Mr. Sherlock Holmes. My name is Lestrade. How do you, how do, you do? I did not offer to shake hands. Very well, thank you. I must say it is unexpected pleasure to meet you. His tone hinted for information. He knew my name was Enola Holmes. He could see that I was a widow. Therefore, he titled me Mrs. But if I were mercifully related by marriage to the Holmes family, he must have been thinking, why would Sherlock send me in his deed? I must say, Holmes ne has never mentioned you to me. Indeed, I, politely I added, and have you discussed your family with him? No, er, I mean, has not been occasion, of course not. My tone remained, I hope, bland, but my thoughts twittered like a ch chaffinch. This snoop would tell Sherlock he had met me. Under what circumstances, at his first opportunity, no worse, as an inspector for Scotland Yard, at any minute he might receive a wire c concerning me. I had to get away before that happened. He seemed suspicious of me already. I had to distract Inspector Lestrade from inspecting me. Opening my gloved hand, I uncoiled a lock of fair hair and held it out to him. Regarding Lord Tewksbury, I said in a commanding mem manner, m mimicking that of my famous brother, he has not been kidnapped. I wave aside the inspector's attempt to protest. He has taken matters into his own hands. He has run away. You would too if you were dressed like a doll in a velvet suit. He wants to go see, go to sea on a boat, a ship, I mean. In the young Vince Count's hideaway, I had seen pictures of steamships, clipper ships, and all sorts of seafaring vessels. In particular, he met, he admires that monastery. The one that looks like a floating cattle through trough. 
with sails on top and the paddle wheels on the side. What's its name? The one that laid the transatlantic cable. But Inspector Lestrade's gaze remained riveted upon the blonde, curling tresses in my hand. He babbled, What? Where? How do you deduce? The Great Eastern. I s At last I remembered the name of the world's largest ship. You will find Lord Tewkesbury at Seaport, probably the docks of London, in all likelihood applying for a berth as a seaman or captain boy, as he has been practicing tying sailor's knots. He has cut his hair. He must have gotten some common clothing somehow. Perhaps from the stable boys. You might want to question them. After such a transformation, I imagine that no one at the station recognized him if he went by train. But the broken door, the forced lock, he did that so that you would search for a kidnapper rather than a one runaway. Rather mean of him, I admitted. To worry his mother so, this thought made me feel better about telling what I knew. Perhaps you could give her grace this. I thrust the lock of hair at the inspector lay straight. Although truly I do not believe whether it would help her feel better or make her feel worse. Gawking at me, Inspector Lestrade seemed to barely know what he was doing as his right hand rose to accept the traces of a duke's son. But, but where did you find this? With his other hand he reached for me to grip me by the elbow and draw me into Basil Weather Hall. Stepping back away from his grip, I became aware of a third party to the conversation at the top of the marble stairway looming amid balustrades and grecian columns madame layla watched and listened i lowered my voice to answer inspector lestrade quite softly in the first floor so to speak of a maple tree with four trunks i pointed in its direction and he turned to look i walked away rather more quickly than a lady should down the drive towards the gates. Mrs. Holmes, he shouted after me. Without altering the rhythm of my pace or looking back, I lifted one hand in a polite but dismissive wave, intimidating the way my brother waggled his walking stick at me. Restraining an Im impulse to run, I kept walking. But when I had passed through the great gates, I breathed it out. Not having ridden in a train before, I was surprised to find the second-class passenger car divided into little parlors for four people each, with leather seats facing each other as in a carriage. I had imagined something more upon, like, omnib like om omnibus, but not so. A conductor led me down a narrow aisle. I opened, opened a door, and willy-nilly, I found myself compared minted with three strangers <sighs> taking one the one remaining place which faced the rear of the train moments later i felt myself being carried slowly at first but by the moment but moment by moment accelerating back towards london all too apt a position as inspector lestrade had received my affairs that i could no longer foresee what lay ahead since he had talked with a nitwit wed widow named enola holmes he would surely tell my brother sherlock i needed to ab abandon my nearly perfect disguise indeed i needed to completely reconsider my situation sighing perched on the on the seat of on the edge of my seat because of my busty or rather luggage i braced myself against my backwards progress the train lurched and swayed as it rumbled along at least twice as fast as any bicycle had ever skimmed down any hill. Trees and buildings whipped past the window at a speed so tumultuous that I had to avoid looking out. I felt a bit ill for more than one reason. My safe and comfortable plans for cab, hotel, general lodgings, and quiet waiting would no longer serve. I had been identified. Either Lestrade or my brother Sherlock would trace a young widow's steps through Belvedere and find that I had gotten onto the afternoon express train into the city. So much for misdirecting my brothers towards Wales. Although they could have no idea of my financial well-being, nevertheless they would know that I had gone to London and there would be nothing I could do, except could do about it.
except leave London as soon as I arrived, by the next train to anywhere. But surely my brothers would empire of the trick king agents, and my now black dress marked me. If Sherlock Holmes found that a widow had gotten on a train to, to say uh, Houndstone, Rockingham, and Pudge Puddingsworth, he would investigate. And surely he would find me easily in Houndstone, Rockingham, Pudding, Puddingsworth, or any such place than London. Moreover, I wanted to go to London. Not that I thought Mother was there. Quite the opposite, actually. But I would be able to find her from there. I had always dreamt of London. Palaces, fant fountains, cathedrals, theaters, operas, gentlemen in tails, and ladies dripping with diamonds. Also the rumbling backward towards the great city. I found myself smiling beneath my veil at this thought. The thought of hiding beneath my brother's noses appealed all the more now that they knew. I would revise their opinion of the cranial capacity of their accidental, accidental younger sister. Very well. London it was. But circumstances had changed so that I had not, upon arriving in the city, take a cab. Sherlock Holmes would inquire of the cab drivers. Therefore, I would have to walk, and night was coming on. But I could not allow myself a hotel room. Surely my brother would inquire all of the hotels. I would have to walk for quite a distance to get myself well enough from the railway station. But to, where to go? If... I took the wrong street. I might sign myself in company with someone who was not of a nice sort of person. I might encounter a pickpocket or perhaps even a cutthroat. Most unpleasant. And just as I thought this, averting my eyes from the dizzying scene outside of the train's window, I glanced up instead at the glass at the cor corridor door. I nearly screamed. There. Like a full moon rising, a large face peered into the compartment, with his nose actually pressed against the glass. The man looked in, scanning each occupant in turn. With no change in his cold expression, he fixed his shadowy gaze on me. He then turned away and moved on. Gulping, I looked around at my fellow passengers to see whether they too were frightened. It appeared not. In the seat next to me, a workman in his cap sprawled snoring. His rough square-toed boots thrust out into the middle of the floor opposite him a fellow in a young shepherd plaid trousers and hornbug had studied a newspaper which judging by the etchings of jockeys and horses concerned itself with with the racetrack and next to him opposite me a squat old woman fixed on something with fixed on me with her cheery gaze something the matter ducky she inquired ducky a most particular mode of address, but I let it pass, asking merely, Who was that man? What man, ducks? Either she hadn't seen him at all, or was perfectly normal for a lar or it was perfectly normal for a large bald man wearing cape cloth caps to appear into railroad parlors, and I was being a fool, shaking my head dismissively, I mum I mu muttered murmured no harm done although my heart declared me a liar you're looking a bit white under all that black my new acquaintance had declared common toothless crone instead of a proper hat she wore an old-fashioned bonnet with a brim that flared like a fungus tied with an old orange ribbon under her bristly chin instead of a dress she wore a fur wrap gone half bald a blouse of somewhat less than white, an old purple skirt with a brand, with a new braid stuck on its faded hem. Peering at me like a robin hopeful of crumbs, she coxed. A, rec a recent lost ducky? Oh, she wanted to know about my fictitious dear departed husband. I nodded. And now you're bound to London? Nod. It's the old story, isn't it, ducks? The vulgar old wo woman leaned toward me with much glee as pity. Catched herself a likely 
un ye did, but now he's died, was the brutal word she used. Gone and died on you, he has left you without the means to feed yourself, and you're looking so sick, maybe with a child in your belly? At first I could scarcely understand, never have, then never having heard anything so unwhisperable stated out loud in a public place, yet in the presence of men, although neither seemed to notice, I found myself shocked speechless, a fiery, a fiery flush heated my face. My friendly tormentor seemed to consider my blush to be affirmation. Nodding, she leaned even closer to me, and now you're thinking ye you can find yourself a supplant to support ye in the city? Have you ever been to London before, my dear? I managed to shake my head. Well, don't be making the old mistake, Ducky, no matter what the gentleman's muns promised. She leaned closer as if telling me a great secret, yet did not lower her voice. If you need a few pennies to your pocket, here's the dodge. Take a petticoat or two out from under your dress. I truly thought I would faint. The workman blessedly snored on, but the other man mistake mistake unmistakably lifted his newspaper to hide his face. Won't never miss him. With a toothless crone gabbled on, why... Many a woman's in London hadn't got a petticoat to her name, and ye with half a dozen, a warm by the puffing and the rustling of them. I desperately wanted the journey and this ordeal to end, so much that I risked a look at the window. Houses upon houses past the glass now, taller buildings pressed together, brick to stone. Take them to Colhane's used clothing on St. Tookings Lane, off Cripple Street. She re relentlessly continued to the hag, whose squat presence now reminded me of a more of a toad than a robin. Down in the east end, you know, you can smell your way there by the docks. And mine, once you find St. Tookings Lane... Don't go to one of them other dealers, but straight to Cole Hands, where you'll get a fair sum for your petticoats if I'm real silk. The man with the newspaper rattled it, cleared his throat, gripping the edge of my seat, leaned away from me. Leaned, I leaned away from the shocking hag, as far as my bustle would allow. Thank you, I muttered. For well, I had no intention, intention of selling my petticoats. Nevertheless, this dreadfully common old woman had helped me. I had been wondering how to dispose of my widow's clothing and get something else. Of course, I had plenty of money to order anything I wanted, but the construction of clothing takes time. Moreover, surely my brother would inquire the established seamstress, and surely I would be remembered, all clad in black, I were fitted for anything except more black or gray, perhaps with a touch of lavender or white. After the first year in mourning, that was all one was supposed to wear. Yet given my brother's cleverness, none of that would do. I could not merely modify my appearance. I needed to transform it completely. But how? Pluck garments off of washing lines? Now I knew. Used clothing shops. St. Tookins Lane off Kipple Street in the in the East End, I did not think my brother was likely to inquire there, nor did I think, as I should have, that I would risk my life venturing there. End of chapter 10